Hi everyone uh, and welcome. Uh, this is the Qualitative Research Methods and Application Virtual Workshop on Phenomenology and Grounded Theory. Um, because of the recent pandemic, I've had to cancel my face-to-face uh, -face workshops at several locations internationally. Um, and uh, we're all locked down, uh, as you well know. And I figured that this might be a great way to reach out to all those participants and others who were uh, so eagerly and anxiously waiting for these workshops to happen uh, on site. So I do apologize that this was not possible. Um, I'm gonna do the best under the circumstances to offer you um, uh, in depth, as far as I can possibly do it uh, without participants being present, um, a uh, workshop on um, uh, phenomenology and an overview of grounded theory. What I'm also going to do is put together um, the pre-workshop materials, which I uh, often send out to participants in advance of the workshop, um, and they read and they reflect and all that. So we're at a disadvantage here uh, because I, this is a one-to-many presentation. So please bear with me. But if you would like a copy of this entire PowerPoint presentation, as well as the uh, online readings, resources, eBooks, I have a very comprehensive folder. Uh, please reach out to me and you will see the email address at the end of this presentation. Reach out to me, let me know that you need it. Um, and I will be happy to send out the resources to you. Also, I'm available to anyone uh, who's pursuing either an MPhil or a doctoral degree program, uh, who's looking for help, guidance, et cetera, in a phenomenology uh, or IPA. IPA is the interpretative phenomenological analysis, which is developed as an approach to analyzing data in UK at the University of Birkbeck by uh, Dr. Jonathan Smith, Larkins, and Flowers. So uh, with that said, let me go uh, and kick this workshop off. Welcome aboard. And uh, I'll look forward to at some point um, connecting with you virtually at the end of the workshop. And uh, who knows down the road, you may be able to attend one of my on-site face-to-face uh, -face sessions um, in the US or overseas. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. Uh, you know, this is the first slide uh, that I kick off the workshop with, and believe it or not, uh, this takes up a huge segment of the workshop, nonetheless a very important one, because I open this up to participants to reflect on what they define, how, how do they define phenomenology, how do they define grounded theory, just broadly, uh, and what is meant by the essence of a phenomenon. So of course, I don't have you uh, uh, guys with me as participants in this workshop. So I'm gonna imagine that, um, uh, you know, some of you were here and were reflecting on phenomenology, grounded theory, and what is meant by the essence of a, of a phenomenon. So let's go to the next slide. Um, you'll often hear when you talk about phenomenology, streams of consciousness. Uh, don't get frightened by this expression, streams of consciousness. It just means that you're a state of consciousness, your living, breathing experiences are conscious experiences. And uh, as you think of something, as you reflect on something, it is this stream of consciousness that we allude to in phenomenology. This is what provides us with uh, your thoughts, your feelings, your, uh, your perceptions about something that you reflect on. And um, so just know that the stream of consciousness is an important concept. And if you go through the readings that I will be sending you, um, you will see uh, from a academic standpoint, from a phenomenological standpoint, what streams of consciousness means. All right. So what does doing phenomenology mean to a researcher? Uh, you know, unlike many of the other um, uh, 
research method methodologies such as quantitative research and even other forms of qualitative research, phenomenology is a distinct animal by itself. It's a very convoluted approach. It uh, can be feel disjointed, very discursive, and difficult to make sense of unless you are familiar with the lexicon and you have worked with the experiences yourself and not just listen to lectures. Uh, a lot of folks tell me, uh, folks says in students tell me, oh, sir, I know a lot about phenomenology. I've attended workshops at IIM Ahmedabad. I've attended a workshop at IIM uh, Bangalore. Uh, uh, and some folks here say I've attended a workshop at Pepperdine or Fielding Graduate Institute. Well, guess what? These are workshops, and yes, you, they do provide you with some sense of what phenomenology means, but unless you immerse yourself in phenomenological thinking and more importantly in the experience of doing phenomenology, practicing phenomenology, you're not going to know how the dots connect what phenomenology even really means, all right? Um, a lot of people confuse it with some other uh, approaches, methodologies within, uh, within uh, quality research and get all the, all the more confused. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm, I'm actually going to provide you with some clarity and some um, uh, illumination on what phenomenology means to you as a researcher. And, uh, and whether phenomenology is an intellectual exercise or an emotional endeavor. I think it's a bit of both. Uh, it's intellectual in the sense that, uh, yes, you're going to be uh, resting on the shoulders of some philosophical giants. Many of them uh, were ger of German origin. There's a lot of heavy German usage, uh, Germanic terms. So I am not going to fill your heads. Uh, or your minds with a lot of that Germanic stuff here. Um, we, you can certainly look it up yourself in uh, the work of Husserl, Heidegger, um, Greta, etc. You know, and they did the great German philosophers. You can certainly go and do your own readings. But phenomenology, in my mind, if I were to say whether it's an intellectual exercise or an emotional ex uh, endeavor, I would say paradoxically, it's both. Um, it's certainly, um, you know, from an intellect standpoint, you have to understand some really basic concepts. Um, and, but from an emotional standpoint, I, I would happen to say that it leans more heavily uh, toward the emotional side of the continuum. Okay. Um, because if, if you're not, uh, of an emotional mindset, if you're not someone that's comfortable with your own and others' emotions, uh, you're going to find yourself at a total loss if you were doing phenomenology or you were practicing phenomenology. Uh, you're going to hear um, a lot, and probably if, later in this presentation, I'm sure there's a slide that we talk about, uh, but if not, I'll just mention it to you right now. We, uh, you probably heard of the expressions uh, ethos, logos, and pathos. Now, ethos is the ethics of a situation. Logos is a logic. But pathos is something you're going to hear of or hear about a lot in phenomenological research. Pathos is emotions. But it's just not any simple emotion. These are deep emotions. These are tender emotions where you're going really deep down uh, into the uh, being empathetic with someone, the really tender uh, emotions that come out when you're interviewing someone. So uh, you can look up pathos, it's, but, but really, if loosely speaking, pathos is emotional, but not just any emotions, very deep emotions. Okay, so enough said about that. Uh, you know, you'll hear the natural science versus human science. A natural science approach would be steeped in academic phenomenology, I mean, I'm sorry, academic psychology, which attempts to predict and control behavior in a laboratory setting. Just please know that most psychology has been cognitive, 
okay, has been in the natural sciences um, uh, field where, you know, you're controlling in a laboratory setting. Uh, you're, you're, you're looking at experiences, but you're looking at more from the standpoint of how to predict how people behave, how people act, how people perceive things. Um, and the, the objective, believe it or not, is to control the behavior in a, in a, in a laboratory controlled setting so you can, you can get some insight into how people behave um, and, and act and react. Now, by contrast, the field that we call human sciences, which of which phenomenology is a part, a human science approach also investigates phenomena, also delves into psychological uh, material, but it does so by studying consciousness as it is experienced in oneself or in someone else. So in an earlier slide, I was showing you streams of consciousness. This is where the streams of consciousness become really, really important. So in a human science, you are studying that consciousness. You're studying how people make sense of something, how people see something from their mind's eye, um, how they recollect certain experiences or what they see how they see it and how they make sense of something, how they draw meaning from something. It's not just having an experience and saying, okay, so I had the experience of a phenomena. I can talk about that with some authority because I was the one experiencing it. But guess what? In phenomenology, lived experience has a different connotation. And uh, I, want, I want you to really understand lived experience when you're doing phenomenology. Lived experience is not just any experience as you're having it. Yes, so you experience going, doing a doctorate, you experience getting married, you experience having a child, all of this, those are experiences. Uh, nonetheless, what is not happening there is you are not reflecting on those experiences as you would if you were Part of a phenomenological study. So later uh, in this presentation, I'm going to try to cover some of that. All right. So just stay with the fact that uh, phenomenology is a human science approach. All right. And you can read up Dilthey's work. You can read up the work of Husserl, who was the father of phenomenology. Heidegger, who was his disciple, later there was a falling out. Heidegger created his ontological approach. Husserl's approach was more transcendental, okay? Uh, as in he was seeing the world outside. He was seeing all phenomena as being on the outside, whereas Heidegger brings it back in. And he says, well, how can the phenomena even occur without you being part of it, all right? So he brought on the, the concept of ontology, which is the nature of being and the mode of being. So this mode of being and the nature of being is attributed originally to um, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, okay? Like, so here we are, Edmund Husserl, 1859 to 1938, he was the father of phenomenology. For him, phenomenology was a departure from behaviorism, uh, Cognitivism and positivism. So it was not about behaviorism as you probably have seen, heard of in the field of psychology. Uh, behavioral psychology, the cognitive psychology, the very positivistic approach, uh, approaches of the time and thinking of the time. It is a return to things themselves as experienced. The one thing you will hear about a lot in phenomena in, in qualitative research in general, but more so in phenomenology. It's all experience, experience, experience. Not only the experience, and, here, and here's the peculiar part. In phenomenology, not only are you looking at the experience of the participants, but you're also looking at your own experiences of researching participants. 
the, your own experiences of pursuing a doctoral study. And that we, we call that reflexivity. Okay, so I'm gonna deal with that later in this presentation. But so please know this all about experiences, heavily experience laden, heavily pathos laden, i.e. not just any experience, but emotional experiences, deep emotional experience. Experience isn't simply a response to the interacting variables, environment, situations, etc., but a system of interrelated meanings, gestalt, so there's a lot of dots that you're looking at that are connecting in a gestalt. It's a totality. And all these dots connect to make up the life world. What is life world? The life world is the world that you inhabit. But also from a research standpoint, the life world is the life world that a participant or a group of participants that you're researching inhabits. So let's say the life world of a transgender individual or the life world of an unwed mother or the life world of people that are suffering from chronic lower back pain or the life world of employees that are embedded in a virtual organization. So they, they inhabit a life world. Now, that is their work life world, life, life world but they're also, you, we're all part of the universe. You were all part of this world that we call, we're all part of the earth, uh, part of a country, part of a society, part of a race, part of, part of an ethnic origin. These are all life worlds. So just, just don't get confused. But from a research standpoint, when you're recruiting participants, you're recruiting participants who share the same life world. All right? Okay. So it's an embodied related, relatedness to one's personal world of, world of experience. Embodied means through the body, okay? When you interact virtually, as I am interacting with you now, this is a disembodied interaction. My body is not present here. But if I was working with you on a, in a face-to-face -face setting, my body would be present. You would be able to see um, my, my facial expressions, you would be able to see my body language. Likewise, I would be able to see how you are relating to me in the classroom, how you're interacting with me. So it's an embodied experience. So when you're looking at phenomenology and looking at uh, the phenomenological research, you're looking at an embodied experience, embodied relatedness to one's personal world of experience, and which is what we call the lived experience, uh, which is what I was just talking about. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Martin Heidegger, as I was just mentioning to you, Martin Heidegger was the disciple of uh, uh, Edmund Husserl, who was the father of phenomenology. And Martin Heidegger has done a phenomenal body of work in mostly ontological phenomenology. And this is just something that he had written, which I thought was very useful uh, and, and very deep and profound. Anyone can achieve their fullest potential. Who are we, who we are might be predetermined, but the path we follow is always of our own choosing. So he says that we have a choice in the direction that we are going to be going in life. We should never allow our fears and expectations of others to set the frontiers of our destiny. Your destiny can't be changed, but it can be challenged, all right? Every more man is born as many men and dies as a single one. Now, here is the phenomenological essence of this entire quote from him. So every man is born as many men. We're all born as many other folks, but we die always alone as a single one, as a single person, a single man, a single woman, single transgender individual, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I just thought I'd share that with you. We usually have, uh, if I were doing this class face-to-face -face with you, we would have a nice discussion on that and a lot of new ideas and and some innovative stuff has always uh, come out of this, this one uh, quote from him. 
So the prominent psychology of phenomenologists uh, are as follows. Transcendental, he was the, uh, you know, he was the father of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl. His phenomenology was mostly descriptive philosophy of a pure essence. So he was referring to phenomenology as something out there happening in the world okay, that you are essentially not a part of. You're observing, and not from the standpoint of a positivist, like a scientist who's doing quantitative research would be observing, but he wanted to bring forward this notion that the phenomena is happening out there, okay? All right, and I have other presentations in my YouTube channel. Uh, if you browse, you will see uh, there's a presentation that's called Lived Experience Epochy and Phenomenological Reduction. I would encourage you to see uh, that presentation, hear that presentation, and it'll throw some light on the work of Edmund Husserl and especially Heidegger. Heidegger's phenomenology, by contrast, was the method of ontology, the nature of being or the mode of being. So when we ask phenomenological research questions, such as what is it like for you to be in a state of negative capability, or what is it like for you to be an unwed mother, unwed single mother, um, raising two, new, two newborn babies? Or what is it like for you to suffer from chronic lower back pain? Or what is it like for you to have experienced sexual abuse or emotional abuse at the hands of a spouse or significant other? So things of that nature. So that what is it like to be is an ontological uh, question, all right? And you'll see a lot of the phenomenological questions are very ontological for whatever reason, um, unless you're doing totally descriptive phenomenology uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the way Edmund Husserl uh, rolled it out. There's also existential phenomenology, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, you'll also hear of Simone de Bois, uh, who's written a lot about feminist psychology, or feminist, I keep saying, so I'm sorry, I keep mixing up between psychology and phenomenology. We're talking about phenomenology, folks. So uh, Simone de Bois uh, has written a phenomenal book, The Second Sex, uh, a, 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 in which she talks about feminist phenomenology. Essentially, so if you are a feminist, doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, but if you strongly believe in feminism and advocate feminism, I would highly encourage you to read that. Hermeneutic phenomenology is the work of Gadamer. Uh, critical phenomenology, Paul Ricoeur. You'll, you'll read about uh, Paul Ricoeur's work. Um, the hermeneutics of suspicion and hermeneutics of interpretation. Sociological phenomenology, a very, very powerful author, Alfred Schutz. So if you have a sociological framework or you have a sociological pursuit, uh, you would be doing well to look into the work of Alfred Schutz. Deconstruction phenomenology, Derrida, embodiment phenomenology. You hear a lot about Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, a French philosopher. And then, of course, descriptive phenomenology, Amedio Giorgi, who uses Husserl's thinking uh, and um, has, as, 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 worked a lot with the descriptive phenomenology. He, he um, uh, shares that, that approach with people and calls it the most scientific approach. Of course, others have sort of agreed and disagreed with him, and, uh, but, but he is a prominent uh, uh, you know, philosopher slash phenomenologist um, and, and very respected in the field too. So it depends on what kind of phenomenology uh, or what kind of phenomenological question you have, or what body of research you're going to be drawing from, you will be looking um, predominantly at one or more of these philosophers, okay? Hermeneutic phenomenology. So the focus of our presentation today is going to be hermeneutic. What is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is the interpretation of text, interpretation of content, 
Uh, so what does interpretation mean? So anytime we are making sense of something, anytime we are trying to draw some meaning from some experiences, we are in a sense interpreting those experiences. So hermeneutics is, you know, broadly speaking, a, a way of interpreting phenomena. All right, IPA is interpretative phenomenological analysis. Just so you folks know, in my YouTube channel, you will see an entire presentation. It's called the use of IPA in qualitative data analysis, uh, where I unpack the entire IPA approach. So I'm not gonna go through that. It just could mean repeating myself. All right. Um, there's also another one that I, um, on IPA that I uploaded a couple of days ago. It's called Deploying IPA for Researching Novel Phenomena. It'll be very useful for folks that are looking at uh, phenomena um, that tend to be very innovative, novel, and uh, I have shared with you in, in that presentation my entire PowerPoint um, that I used, my presentation that I used for my own doctoral dissertation, which by the way, uh, was recorded live and, and is the archives are also in my YouTube channel. So I've shared with you how you can take a phenomena and, and from soup to nuts really, uh, you know, I've shown you the entire process of how do you go about uh, doing the data collection, how do you do the data analysis, the interpretation, and the writing of the phenomenological study. So I would encourage some of you to just go into that also and take a look. Um, I think you'll find it interesting. Let's reflect. So phenomenology insists that daffodils are indeed different for a wandering poet than they are for a hard-pressed horticulturalist. So a horticulturalist is you know, it's a profession, it's the person's job to take care of nurseries and plants and flowers and things of that nature. This horticulturist is probably looking at roses and daffodils and petunias and, 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 and all the other flowers um, from a different viewpoint. He or she is looking at these flowers like an everyday. It's a taking taken for granted. It's part of his or her job. So they are not looking at flowers individually uh, or artistically or aesthetically even. But for a wandering poet, someone that takes a walk through the nursery who's not necessarily involved, just as a visitor, you know, when you see a flower show, we go to this uh, Philadelphia uh, flower show uh, it's, they put up a really grand uh, affair this time because of the pandemic. It's not going to happen, uh, but it's awesome because it, the flowers really talk to you in a manner of speaking. So if you have that poetic sense, that aesthetic sense of beauty and, 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 the, uh, and the sensitivity and the tenderness of something, of nature, uh, that's what you're called upon to do as a phenomenologist. That's where I was talking about the pathos, all right? That's where it comes in. And so if you have that capacity to feel, to emote, to almost have a conversation with something so inanimate, all right? Uh, your phenomenological studies are going to be very, very interesting, all right? Uh, the individual is a conscious agent whose experience must be studied from the first person perspective. Now, here's something that is a little perplexing to the novice researchers who first come into phenomenology uh, and before they read up on phenomenology and read up other authors. Uh, the issue here is that when you're doing quantitative research or even other forms of qualitative research such as ethnography, ethnomethodology, ethnography, um, and case study analysis, narrative, discursive analysis, all that stuff, you will see that oftentimes um, it's written in the third person. Okay, The researcher did this or researcher did that. It's, it's kind of like in the third person. But in phenomenology specifically, the reader wants to know what you did, right? 
what you experienced as a researcher. What did you bring to the research? How did you help or hinder the co-creation of knowledge with the participant? All right. What, what, was, what about your own reflexivity? What about your own assumptions? So things of that nature become very, very critical. So you, typically speaking, when you're writing a phenomenological study, your introduction chapter might have um, a, a, a large part um, in written up in the first person. Uh, your data analysis, data collection will be written in the first person. Your literature review, of course, you're referring to the, the extant literature you're, 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 you're talking about conversations that have happened elsewhere uh, around your phenomena. So you're talking about the work of others. When you're talking about others' work, you're obviously writing from the third person perspective. Uh, you might say Elson, 1999, paraphrasing, said this, that, or the other, or Sigmund Freud said that. So, you know, uh, just please know that the first person perspective is really nothing more than an active voice. So when you're doing phenomenology, you have to bring or you have to be able to bring your active voice into it. All right, so, so enough said about that. The personal lived experience is therefore perspectival and ideographic. Let me explain what that means. It's, it's a perspective. There is no one shape, there is no one hardcore absolute reality. An experience can be of many different shades, many different forms. This, you're talking about the same exact phenomena, but you're interviewing different people. Different people are having different experiences about the same thing. They are looking at it from different lenses. Uh, it's a perspective, all right? It's nothing more than a perspective, a unique perspective of someone. All right, so that's where perspectival comes in. Um, ideographic means that you're specifically looking at the individual experiences of someone on their own terms, in their own words, okay? All right, and so you'll, you'll see and hear a lot about the ideography in IP, especially interpretative phenomenological analysis. So when you're taking individual accounts or retrospective accounts of individuals and narrating them and, and unpacking what they said and interpreting them, et cetera, et cetera, you are really going for the ideog ideographic focus. Nomothetic, you're here of nomina and phenomena. Nomina uh, is, um, is something that is attributed mostly to, um, to Sartre, okay? And, uh, or actually, I apologize, not to Sartre, but to Immanuel Kant, okay? A philosopher who was talking about the absolute or generic. He talks about something that is so, outside the reach of human beings. It, nomina is something that you cannot humanly achieve, humanly understand. So it's out there, it's very idealistic, almost godly, okay? Only gods can see that. But we're all human beings, right? So the phenomena is something that is experienced by us using our senses, using our emotions, using our feelings, okay? It could be uh, somatically through touch. It could be tactile. It could be uh, very experiential, okay? So you're bringing those experiences into phenomenology, all right? So, so just know that there is such a thing called noumena and then there's phenomena. Noumena is out of reach. It's humanly not even possible to attain, but phenomena is something that we, of course, study. Phenomenology as a stream of consciousness. So I'm getting back to what I started the presentation with, streams of consciousness. What are the streams of consciousness? So let's look at this. And I'm gonna roll my cursor uh, around here because I don't have the other uh, uh, pointer here. The consciousness is not just limited to awareness, but also pre-conscious and unconscious processes. 
So when I say consciousness, that, that I, your consciousness is the one, there are three levels of consciousness. It could be unconscious, which is the deepest level, which is out of reach, okay? It is unfathomable. You can only sense it through metaphors, through symbols and other archetypes, but you cannot reach it. You cannot control the unconscious. It is always hovering down there into the abyss, all right? And playing tricks with your mind. Uh, the pre-conscious layer is a layer that is above conscious, above un the unconscious, but below the conscious layer. So think of the pre-conscious as, as something that's there. It's sort of out of your everyday consciousness, but you know it is there and you can, if you, if you put your mind to it, if you make an endeavor to reflect a little more deeply, you can bring that pre-conscious material up. Okay, all right. So, so understand that consciousness is the whole gamut of the consciousness up top, the awareness, the pre-conscious awareness, and the unconscious processes. So you are talking about phenomenologies, all of those processes, not just the uh, consciousness as in what is the participant saying to you in the, in the here and now, but, uh, and, and how you're making sense of that. But you have to be able to, as an interviewer, as a researcher, be able to guide the interview, this, and usually we do semi-structured, in-depth interviews uh, with a particular interview schedule, that you are guiding this participant and through prompts, through encouragement, uh, and, and not necessarily steering them, but guiding them to bring forth material that may have been lost within their consciousness for years and years and years. So when you ask someone to reflect on sexual abuse that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago at the hands of someone, that person may have forgotten that on a conscious level, but it is there repressed in the unconscious mind. So how do you bring forth that if it's sitting in the unconscious? You know, as I previously said, the unconscious is out of your awareness, but it is there. So the participant can say, emote, um, share some experiences, and you could then start to put those experiences together and, and co-create the knowledge out of that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a difficult process. So for the most part, we are not in phenomenology going deeply into the unconscious processes unless you are a very trained uh, psychoanalyst or a psychologist who has worked with the unconscious. And typically the Jungian um, analysts uh, work a lot with unconscious processes. So do the psychodynamic consultants. But if you're not none of those, I would stay with just the consciousness and the pre-conscious or the subconscious, all right? Uh, because as a novice researcher, you don't want to get caught up in the weeds uh, and come away from the interview saying, oh my God, I was digging into the unconscious process. I didn't get anywhere. Uh, nothing really came through because of that. So please be cognizant of that. Phenomenology aims to capture as closely as possible the way something is experienced in the context of that experience. So you really have to have a context. So what do we mean by a context? I could ask a question, what does employee engagement mean to you? I could just ask someone, what does employee engagement mean to you? But so if I don't provide a context, as in the workplace, as in your interactions with clients, uh, or your interactions with your peers and your colleagues and your bosses, you know, you, you're just gonna give me a very generic um, uh, answer, a generic narrative. What I'm looking for is more contextual. So when I say, what is it like, what does employee engagement mean to you as you work in a predominantly virtual organization? Now I'm bringing in virtuality as a context into that. So I'm giving this person some more uh, fodder to chew on. Now there's something more concrete 
So, and you're bringing in the context because you're wanting the person to help or help you with, with the interview so that this person can go back. This person, meaning the participant, can go back and reflect on that experience in that particular context. You know, for instance, there are leadership styles. Many leadership styles change from context to context. There is not one set leadership style that is good for all contexts. And that's why leadership is so contextual. So when we are researching leaders, we might have to say, okay, is a leader, a leader of a very authoritative organization? Is it the leadership in a military organization? Or is it leadership in a very democratic organization or a very innovative, creative organization? So context is important um, to be provided in phenomenology. It attempts to investigate and make sense the phenomenological essence. So the phenomenological essence is something, it's sort of idealistic, it's sort of elusive. At the same time, it's not hidden. It's out there. You know, people tell me, okay, so I'm researching this phenomena, but the phenomena is really not clear to me. And am I really going down the wrong rabbit hole here? No, that's not true. Uh, if you have a sense of your phenomenological topic um, and you have a, some sort of a research question in your mind, you can certainly fine tune the research question. All right. Uh, and, and, the, and the phenomena is actually sitting there. It is obscured by layers and layers of biases, your interpretations, your theoretical frameworks, uh, et cetera. So think of it as an object that's been sitting in the attic for 25, 30 years, covered by all these cobwebs, these layers of dust and dirt, okay? At first glance, at first blush, you cannot make sense of it. You know it's something, and you know it probably looks like a vase or looks like a pot or looks like an urn, but you don't know what it is. So what do you do? You start to brush off the layers of the dust you start to brush off. So this brushing off is called bracketing. And we will talk about that in a subsequent slide. All right. It's the epochy. Okay. It, and, and, that, and that the epochy and the phenomenological reduction are processes that are used when you start to do data analysis. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Phenomenology is a poetizing project. If you're not and I don't mean by that you have to be poets. You know, that's not what I'm implying here. But if you read the work of Max Van Manen, you know, which I refer to a lot, uh, he is one of the contemporary psychoanal um, if contemporary phenomenologists, has done a phenomenal amount of work on that. His rudimentary text is researching lived experience. Um, and his uh, more advanced, more dense text uh, book is Phenomenology of Practice, which is about meaning making methods in phenomenological research and writing. So I would highly recommend you read that. But what he's saying here is, as in poetry, it is inappropriate to ask for a conclusion or a summary of a phenomenological study. So one thing I've run into is doctoral students that I work with saying, uh, Dr. Bell, uh, my research faculty, they're asking me, what is it that you're trying to, to discover? What is it that you're trying to find? What is this earth shattering thing that you want to do? You'll be spending four or five years of your life in this doctoral program. What, are you, what is it that you're after? What do you hope to achieve? What do you hope to get? You're spending all this money, time, sweat equity. You're burning the midnight oil. Okay. What do you hope to achieve? So please know that phenomenology is not about seeking tangible, concrete outcomes. Okay. That's not what you're after. You're after the essence of a phenomena. You're, you're trying to get to the core of something. To summarize a poem in order to present the result would be destroying the result because the poem itself is the result. So when you ask a, a poet, what did you discover from this poetry? 
What did you find? What were the outcome? What are your findings from this? Well, the whole process of right the poetry in itself is the result. Likewise, the whole process of doing phenomenology, of research and interacting with uh, human subjects, i.e. Your, your participants, and doing the data analysis, doing data collection, and, 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 and all of that good stuff, and the writing, that in itself is the entire journey. That's the outcome. That's what you're finding out. And of course, in chapter, in your last chapter, sometimes it's chapter five, sometimes it's chapter six, you will talk about what came through to you through the analysis, right? And those could be some findings, those could be some, something to do with uh, what you found when you did the, the entire data analysis for the 13 or 14 interviews or the 10 interviews that you did. So uh, just please know that it's a poetizing project. And I, I really love this uh, quote by Max Van Manen. As in poetry, it is inappropriate to ask for a conclusion or a summary. To summarize a poem in order to present the result would destroy the result because the poem itself is the result. The poem is the thing. The poem is the phenomena. All right, let's go to the next one. So elements of the phenomenological method. So how do we go about something so ephemeral, something so elusive sometimes? Uh, because your phenomena might not always be extremely concrete, like mine was negative capability. It's the capacity to stay in mysteries, doubts, and uncertainties without the irritable reaching out of fact and reason. This was an expression that was coined by the famous English romantic poet, uh, John Keats, uh, as you might have all known. Uh, in 1815, the young poet is looking at the Shakespearean capacity to stay in that sensational mode and talks about being in this state of knowing and not knowing, this dialectical tension between knowing something and not knowing between certitude and incertitude. So how do you stand at the edge of knowing and not knowing? And how do you manage that tension, that paradox? So for me, that was a novel phenomenon. When, you start, when I started to look at the extant literature to do my literature review, I realized that there wasn't much literature out there from the standpoint of leadership and organizational thinking because you know I was a doctoral student uh, pursuing my uh, PhD in organizational development and systems uh, work. So uh, you know all the literature I could find on negative capability was from the standpoint of aesthetics and poetry and certainly not about leadership. Um, so what do you do? So you have to look, you have to go tangentially, look for other conversations that are happening around your phenomena. All right. So again, phenomenology can research some very concrete phenomena, but usually, more often than not, we go into a phenomenological endeavor to research novel phenomena. Okay. It's a method of learning. It's a well, it's a method of knowing through doing, telling, and sharing. Again, that's everything to do with experience. It's a method of learning about another person by listening to their evocative descriptions free of our preconceptions and interfaces. Here, folks, is what I was talking about bracketing or epoching. It's just called E P O C H E. So how do you bracket your preconceived notions? You are part of the study. You're so intimately involved. You're a co-creator of knowledge with the participant. How do you then humanly, cognitively put aside into brackets your biases, your preconceptions, your uh, theoretical frameworks, your ideas, your uh, conjectures about the phenomena? Because if you don't, these will inevitably impinge on the research because you will be you will already have formed an understanding 
a reflective understanding of the phenomena. So what is it that you're going to really research? There's no virgin territory for you to research. But by bracketing, by keeping aside these notions, these biases, what you're really in effect doing is looking at the phenomena and allowing the phenomena to show itself to you, to reveal itself to you. Remember I talked about that vase, which is covered with all this dust sitting in the attic for 20 some years. Well, once you start to brush it off, you're able to more visibly clearly see what the phenomena is, what, what the object is, what the artifact is. So um, you will use in phenomenology in-depth semi-structured interviews. I'm not going to dwell into that. You all know I have a, um, a presentation. It's called Phenomenology Bootcamp 1 and 2, two presentations uh, that I did for um, uh, PhD students at IAM Ahmedabad and IAM uh, Bangalore. At their request, I did a two-part um, uh, virtual uh, boot camp for that. So you may want to go into that. I have uh, unpacked the entire process that we go through. I've discussed semi-structured interviews, uh, how you're, you're able to craft them, what kind of prompts you should be putting in them and all that. So, so all of that good stuff is in there. The researcher assumes an active voice and role. This is something that I just talked about. Phenomenologies are written in the first person. And just so you folks know, uh, yes, data collection is important, doing the design, the right, all of that stuff is good. But about 60 to 70% of the entire phenomenological endeavor is about writing. Your phenomenology comes to life through your words, through your narratives. And what are you narrating? Not only what you are what comes to you, but you're narrating how you made sense of how the participants made sense of the phenomenon. And we call that the double hermeneutic. Okay, I think I'm going to talk about that in a, in a, in a subsequent slide. Your practice elements. So please know, and this is extremely, extremely, extremely critical. Phenomenology is not about hype hypothesizing. It is not about theorizing. It is not about validating. It's not about refuting. It's not about taxonomizing. Taxonomizing meaning giving order to something. It is not about defining. It is not about describing in that way. So it's about remaining in mysteries and doubts about what it is that's going to emerge. You have to be open to surprise, open to wonder, okay? So you don't use a theoretical model to determine the research question. So when you're, you come across a research question and it is the outside the scope of this presentation to really go deep into research question, but I've gone in my other presentations uh, uh, certainly spent a lot of time on research questions. Please feel free to look them, <coughs> excuse me, look them over. The primacy of the life word. Your life word is important from the standpoint of phenomenology. It means that our approach to understanding is pre-theoretical and pre-reflective. So let me share with you, um, a lot of times people say, well, can I be doing phenomenological research uh, for some and researching participants in the present, of course, you're doing them in the present, but talking about the present as in the here and now. Well, phenomenologies or phenomenological accounts are written in the, again in the first person, but you're, re, you're asking participants to recount, to recollect retrospectively the experiences that they had in the past. So while you are in the present with someone, as in when you're interviewing someone in the present, and they're talking about that something which happened. That something is now already moved into the past, has it not? You're discussing with them a phenomena, all right, 
But the moment they start to talk about that phenomena in a from a research standpoint, and they start to reflect on that phenomena, they go into what is known, we, we call it the pre-reflective mode, the pre-theoretical. So you're asking them not to put their theoretical frameworks or spin into this, but just to reflect on that as though it was an innocent child reflecting on something, right? That's what you're really after, the tenderness and the innocence there. Um, Try to come as close as you can to understanding the experiences being lived. So again, unless you know the, the lived meaning of lived experience, you, you don't know what you're researching. So understanding the experiences, understanding the lived experiences of participants is an important aspect of phenomenology. All of phenomenology is about researching lived experience. So again, uh, I have a presentation um, in my YouTube channel on lived experiences. I would highly encourage you to go take a look at that. There is no claim that phenomenological results are predictive or replicable. Unlike in psychology, we, 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 in traditional you know, cognitive psychology or from a positive standpoint, where it's about data and charts and numbers and figures and laboratory exp uh, experiments and such, where you're looking for replicability. So you're looking for, is this same experience going to be repeated? So as in, right now we're in a pandemic and researchers around the world, scientists around the world are trying to come out with a vaccine, all right? Test trials are being done, test runs are being done. People have been injected with these vaccines, you know, trial groups, okay? Uh, but if they're doing research on, on, on this, and they have a, a research population of about say 50 or 60 or 100 or a thousand people. And all thousands are having different uh, reactions to the vaccine, right? Then they're going to, they're going to throw that vaccine out. They, that is not what they're going to be able to use. They want to see that, the, that most, if not all of them, are responding to that vaccine in a in a favorable way, i.e. that they're able to fend off COVID-19, correct? So, and that's the traditional scientific part. We are not doing that, even though this is scientific, this is structured, but this is not a hands-off observer. You're not a hands-off observer, you're, to, you're actually co-creating the knowledge. So, there is no claim that phenomenological results are predictive or replicable, which means that if you were to research the exact same phenomena with 25 participants or 15 participants, all right, you know for sure that all of those accounts or most of them are going to talk about it from their perspective. That's why I called it the multi perspective. They're all going to have a look at the phenomena through their own lenses, through their own ideas, through their own frameworks. They own, and that's the, the role of the hermeneutics. They're interpreting that phenomena through their own eyes. So there is no claim here that it is predictive or replicable. So if you were to do the exact same study with, let's say a group of another 10 people, same phenomena, same research design, everything, you're gonna come out with a totally different result totally different outcome, totally different uh, findings, all right? So uh, just please know that this is what makes it so innovative, but this also makes it very complex, okay? It's not for the faint-hearted. Um, this, uh, uh, I, would, I would highly encourage you uh, to look into phenomenology only if you're able to go on this long journey and, um, and, and, and try to make sense of how others make sense of something, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Phenomenology lexicon, I already talked about bracketing. Bracketing is suspending or setting aside our biases, everyday understandings, theories, beliefs, habitual modes of thought and judgments, okay? So you set them aside for the purpose of research, okay? Knowing fully well that it is not humanly possible to set them totally aside. Uh, more often than not, you'll see that your own frameworks your own ideas will try to 
impinge on the process, impinge on the research. And then and, and that's why the research of reflexibility comes into it. You have to have a highly aware researcher, okay, who has the capacity to hold um, two different uh, dialectical ideas in a container, in two separate containers, if you will, as a manner of speaking. Uh, because you know that this is, as you're interpreting it, your mind is rushing to the judgment. But uh, the other part of you is saying, pause, stop, Anil, stop. You can't do that. You have to just go and see what is in the data. All right. So epochy, uh, learning to look at things in a way it's such that we see only what stands before our eyes, only what we can describe and define, placing in parentheses. Okay. It was an expression that was coined by Husserl. First opening, a direct experience of a person, object, or event before any of our mental screens or filters change it. So it's the first opening you're looking for, you're striving for the almost like unfathomable, uh, something that's, that's so idealistic. And, and yet you know that that is not achievable. So in a, in a very strange paradoxical sense, a phen phenomenology is an impossible endeavor. Now you might say to me, okay, so what the heck am I doing here? If I'm doing phenomenology, spending all these years of my life doing a doctoral study, am I just wasting my time, energy, resources, money? Well, you have to really know what phenomenology does, what, what is the purpose, what is the goal of phenomenology? So if you understand the goal and the objective carefully, uh, I think you're not going to question yourself all that much, okay? Uh, lexicon continued, Wurstehan, you'll see here another expression. It's a rejection of positivist social science. It means to understand, perceive, know, and comprehend the nature and significance of a phenomenon. It is the empathic understanding. So empathic, again, comes from pathos, understanding of human behavior from the actor's own standpoint. Again, this is an ideographic focus here, okay? Because you're looking at every person's, every individual's, every participant's experience on their own terms, in their own words, okay? And you're looking at nothing else. You're just taking that participant for the, and, and going by their own agency, okay? Hermeneutic circle, the relation of a part to the whole and the whole to its parts. So as you're doing this phenomenological study, you will be writing up individual case narratives. Uh, we call them cases, by the way. It's not a case study, but the cases, or you can call them interview one, interview two, but the lexicon that we use in IPA is cases. So is the relationship, relationship of one case to the whole corpus and the corpus to an individual case. So this comes up more from the standpoint of doing data analysis and as you're going through iteration. Triple hermeneutics, the reader is making sense of the researcher, making sense of the participant, making sense of phenomena. It sounds like a mouthful, but really think of this um, in, in, in the way that once you've done your study and I'm reading your doctoral study, okay? I, as a reader, I want to understand what you did, all right? For me, participants are way out there. Yes, they are the stakeholders. I mean, yes, you, without them, we, we would have no study. But I want to see how you, as the researcher, made sense of the, or drew meaning from the participants who were in turn making sense of the phenomena. The phenomena is way out there, okay? We're all looking at the phenomena. We all have that phenomena in our, in our heads, but we are looking at this through multiple lenses. And that's what makes phenomenology so rich, all right, but also so convoluted and also so complex, okay, uh, and becomes very abstract. And that's one of the reasons why people don't, uh, or some people, shy away from qualitative research because they're told by their committees, oh gosh, it's going to be too abstract, all right? Are you comfortable with all this abstract notions? So 
So please know that um, it's, again, it's sense making through different lenses. Paradoxically bilateral. So when you're, you're a co-creator of knowledge as an interviewer, when you're looking at and, and researching participants through in-depth semi-structured interviews, what you're really doing is you're paradoxically bilateral with them, i.e. you're not a hands-off researcher as you would be in quantitative studies or other forms of qualitative research. Or even in ethnography, you are sometimes hands off. You're looking at an observer. Yes, you are an observer. You are observing. How can you not be observing when you're interviewing people um, in a semi-structured format? Yes, you are. But while you're doing that, you're also asking them, you're prodding them, you're prompting them, you're, you're directing in a way the interview so that you can get rich, evocative, and discursive accounts because that's what it you're looking for these descriptive accounts okay so the challenge is the imbalance of the researcher participant relationship okay um, you know you if you're not comfortable with that you can get torn between uh, how much of a role do i have to play as a participant or, or as an as a researcher and how much role should the participant play well guess what if the participant is not talking about 75 to 80 percent of the time in the interview you're doing something wrong this is not your interview yes you are participating in it you're co-creating this you're guiding and and, and 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 directing it but you allow the participants accounts because the you want to know what the participant how the participant is making sense of a study phenomena are you not so you stay hands off, but you, you're not totally hands off. You're there ephemerally hands off, but then you also move in. You ask another question. Well, can you tell me about another experience that you had with lower back pain? Or can you tell me about the stigmatization that has happened to you as a member of a transgender community, okay, or LGBT community? So they are dominant, but also submissive. So yes, you could be dominant, dominant in the sense that it's not from an authoritative standpoint, dominant meaning you know that you're there for a purpose and your purpose is to collect rich data. All right. So if you feel that the interview is steering in the wrong direction or uh, in a direction that you don't want to go, all right, or the participant is just rambling on and on and on, you, ha you have to be in control of the interview and bring that person back but also not be so submissive as to say, or so directive as to say, hey, you know what? Uh, if you don't come back to the way I want, I'm asking these questions, we'll have to stop the interview, okay? It's a, it's a delicate dance. It's, it, 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 and that's what makes it so challenging, all right? So you're in a paradoxically bilateral, bilateral meaning both sides, okay? They're assertive and non-assertive. So you can be both assertive and non-assertive, powerful and powerless. It's okay if you lose, you're losing control, but if you're losing control and the, and the participant is really talking and giving you some rich data on the, on the um, phenomena, you want the participant to continue talking. You don't want to cut them short. You don't want to shortchange the process. But at the same time, you have to know be cognizant of the fact that um, you have to be able to go to the next question, right? Because you only have this much time, 90 minutes or, or, or an hour long interview, depending on what you do. The phenomenological method of research honors a paradoxically bilateral relationship. I just said that is just repeating that. The phenomenological reduction. So what is the phenomenological reduction when we are trying to analyze the essence of a phenomenon or get to or pursue the essence of a phenomena. Uh, what we're doing is we're following a process of reduction. It is an attempt to suspend the observer's viewpoint, epochy, okay, or bracketing. It is hearing another person's reality and focusing on the central, dominant, or recurring themes which represent the essential qualities or meanings of that person's experience. So you're trying to get Again, you're not asking the person to define 
describe, validate, or hypothesize, or speculate on the facticity, facticity meaning the, whether it's true or false. You're never in a in phenomenological interview uh, dwelling on whether, oh my goodness, so is this participant telling me the truth? It sounds like this guy's making it up. Uh, no, that's not your job. Right? They're talking about the phenomena. And if you feel if it's like blatantly obvious to you that this person is um, fabricating it, you may, you may at some point want to decide if the entire interview is about fabrication and they're playing with you and exaggerating and all that. You may, you know, at your own option, uh, drop that interview from the focus and let them know that you dropped it, right? And um, uh, because in the informed consent, right, there is, it's voluntary for them. So if they feel that they don't want to be part of the study post the interview, uh, they certainly have the right to withdraw from the study. And you certainly, as the researcher, have every right to not introduce or not incorporate their data into the study if you feel that the data is not going to help your study in any way, all right? But you are focusing on their experiences and you're trying to draw meaning from that experience. You're trying to make sense hermeneutically. You're trying to interpret those experiences. The epoch reduction methods, uh, there is a, uh, I, I, like I said, uploaded a presentation. It's called Lived Experience Epochy and Phenomenological Reduction I've, on my YouTube channel. I would encourage you all to go there. That's a more in-depth um, uh, explanation of that. But I just want to list these here just for, so you know. The heuristic epochy reduction awakens a profound sense of wonder. Wonder is not intrigue. It's not uh, something exciting. You know, uh, wonder is something that he describes, Max Van Manen describes as the unwilled willingness to meet what is utterly strange in what is most familiar. So again, it's a mouthful, but let me say it again. Wonder, so what is it that you're awakening? You're awakening a sense of wonder. And wonder is the unwilled willingness to meet what is utterly strange in what is most familiar, okay? So what, how, do you, how do you get to that? You have certain taken for granted attitudes, your preconceived notions, you're removing them, you're bracketing those notions from the standpoint of research, okay? The next one is hermeneutic epoch reduction. You're bracketing all interpretations. Hermeneutics is about interpretation, right? So you bracket all interpretations and focus on openness. So you are opening your mind to everything that's going to speak to you and you're gonna allow the phenomena to speak to you, allow the essence to come forth without you interfering or, in, or making interpretations prematurely about it. The experiential epoch reduction brackets theory or theoretical meanings. So again, that's what you're putting into brackets. You're putting them aside. Your theory or your theoretical meanings or understanding of that. The methodological epoch reduction brackets all conventional techniques. So just these are some methods that we use uh, typically when we are doing reduction, phenomenological reduction, okay? Phenomenology, one definition among many. So I'm trying to capture some of this experience that we've had so far talking about this. So phenomenology attempts to gain access to the primordial, which is ancient, antique, old, pre-reflective, something that has not been reflected on from a theoretical standpoint. And originary, originary meaning original, structures of phenomena. So you're looking at phenomenological structures, how? Through the streams of consciousness. Without theorizing, so there is no theory here, right? And not that I'm suggesting that in a phenomenological study, there's gonna be no theories. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you're looking at the phenomena, when you're researching the phenomena, no, you're not theorizing. You're not putting forward your own ideas, hypotheses about something. 
you're not explicating, you're not explaining, you're not validating, refuting, taxonomizing, or hypothesizing. There are no hypotheses, folks. You're not setting up a hypothesis as you would in a quantitative study. Uh, you could have hypothesis one, hypothesis two, and then you go ahead and either prove or disprove the, the hypothesis. That's not what you're doing here. Your mind must become a thoroughfare for a retrospective account of what it was to have lived the experience, what it was for you to have your participants recount what it was for them to have lived the experience of abuse or badly or, or um, uh, unwed motherhood or, uh, you know, a number of different things or sexual abuse or whatever. That experience need not be extraordinary. You can find wonder in a most extraordinary experience. Again, as I was sharing with you, Max Van Menen's wonderful quote here, wonder is the unwilled willingness to meet what is utterly strange and what is most familiar. So the, some of the most familiar experiences, you're sitting in a cafe, you're talking to somebody, it's an ordinary experience, right? And then something happens. Somebody passes by that you had never seen, it was a friend, it was a colleague, you'd never seen in the last 20 years. And then you, you say to yourself, wow, this, this gal looks very familiar to me. Who is she? And then your mind starts to wonder. And then you forget about that for, for a minute and you go back to your conversation with, with, your, uh, with your friend that you were sitting in the cafe with. And then somebody taps you on the, on the shoulder. And there's a soft voice in your ear, a nail. And all those memories come flooding. All those memories come flooding into you. You remember that this was a person that you knew maybe in high school or uh, first year of college or second year of college. And you distinctly remember her voice because she was a good friend of yours. Okay. And your just mind just starts to go into this frame of wonder. So it was a very ordinary, very mundane experience. You were sitting there sipping coffee with a friend, but something happens. Okay. Something jolted you out of that. It was not something extraordinary, but it becomes, takes on a novel and extraordinary form. So most ordinary experience can feel to be extraordinary, okay? Grounded theory lexicon. So I'm gonna, from this point, I'm just gonna go a little bit um, faster because it's uh, already a long presentation, but I just wanted to share some concepts with you real quick. Uh, we talk about three, uh, when we talk about grounded theory, grounded theory and um, phenomenology are both inductive approaches, okay? So phenomenology is an inductive approach in that you're looking at specific cases and making some general statements. You're not making general grand theories as you would in quantitative research, but you're going from from individual to general, right? And likewise, in grounded theory, you're doing the same thing. But the focus of the two research methodologies are, is totally different, right? There are commonalities. You'll do the coding, you'll do all of that, um, semi-structured interviews, and you'll have the iteration process and all of that stuff, but you're not gonna have. And so I have a lot of material in that folder uh, which uh, those of you that request it, I will be happy to send to you and you can certainly look these up there. But let me move to the, so what is grounded theory? Well, how would you define grounded theory? What is in it, what is grounded in it after all? And what is the objective in pursuing grounded theory? Why were Glacier and Strauss so eager to change the research landscape? So how would you define grounded? Grounded theory, is grounded in the data. Everything that you're doing in grounded theory method is immersed in the data. There is nothing that is coming from outside. So that's why it's called grounded. It's grounded in the data. Data meaning what you're collecting, okay? What is the objective in pursuing? Grounded theory maybe because it's not always about coming up with a spectacular new theory or forming something that 
it's earth shattering. You become another Einstein. Maybe you would, who knows? But typically what you're doing in grounded theory is looking at the theoretical frameworks of the phenomena around the phenomena, and you're trying to find a new way of thinking about your phenomena theoretically. So you're, not, you're either trying to refine an existing extent theory, or you're trying to determine new ways of looking at it. So why were Glacier and Strauss so eager to change the research landscape? Well, Glacier and Strauss were, were positivists at one time, and they were getting tired of all this positivism and all this psychological stuff that was happening. And um, they wanted to formulate a new method which uh, would be qualitative, as in through in-depth, uh, you know, semi-structured interviews, uh, and to create a new research landscape. So they were the creators of, of the grounded theory method. And uh, again, in my folder, uh, when you see it, you will see uh, lots of uh, articles papers uh, and uh, so even the entire ebook by Glazier and Strauss, I am making available to everybody who is interested. All right. uh, they've written that, they, the, 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 they were the pioneers of this and uh, their book is just absolutely phenomenal. I, it's a must read, okay? Um, grounded theory you'll hear, induction is from specific to the general, as I said. So while it's an inductive approach, it starts with specific cases, right? Because you're looking at interviewing 15, 20, 30 interviews. And in grounded theory, unlike in phenomenology, you go ahead and keep interviewing more and more participants till you reach a stage of saturation. And, and I'm not going to go into the, the whole concept of saturation. You can look it up. But deduction is the opposite. In induction, you're looking from specific to general. In deduction, you're looking from general to specific. You will hear in grounded theory another concept called abduction. Not as being, you're being abducted uh, by, by aliens. Okay, that's not what we are talking about in induction. But in abduction, what we are talking is with an observation that attempts to find the simplest, most plausible explanation. So when participants make an observation or you observe something that your participants accept about the phenomena that you're researching, uh, you try to find the simplest, most plausible explanation. It considers all possible theoretical explanations for the data, forms hypotheses for each. Now you will see these expression hypotheses because there are hypotheses, you are hypothesizing before you're getting into a grounded theory uh, methodology. And in grounded theory, um, unlike in phenomenology and many other research methodologies, you do not do a, typically, you do not write a literature review chapter, okay? You do not create a bibliography, okay? The reason for that is you want your mind to be open to new ideas that are coming in, open to this data that you're getting. So you refrain from doing, uh, creating a references list, you refrain from creating a literature review, that can come, but it can come at the end when you, you're trying to go in and support whatever new theory uh, that you created or refined, etc. So please just keep in mind, induction, deduction, abduction. And again, my PowerPoint will be open um, to, to many of you. It'll be part of that uh, online folder if you'd like to use that uh, for reviewing um, some of the material that we had talked about. Grounded theory concepts. Grounded theory is a systematic methodology in the social sciences involving the construction of theory. So either you're constructing a new theory where one doesn't exist or one is not adequate to explain and or has become outdated and needs refinement. And what is grounded in the research data itself. So as I said, it's all grounded in the research data. So whatever data you're collecting, this is where it's going to be, that's your corpus. That's where you're going to look 
and and that's what actually makes the process a little bit easier but also extremely hard all right because you may have to go back and interview the person again or the person meaning the participant again um, and and when you look at the whole data set you may not really be able to find something and and that there's always a risk when you're doing grounded theory unlike in phenomenology and other approaches which are more definitive uh, this is you you're you're in totally uncharted territory out there and grounded theory is in and about the data again it's a repetition of the previous uh, statement it does not seek grand theories that may not have anything to do with a particular study so you're not looking at this grand theory out there that can take care of this entire study it is an inductive approach to doing research but also think of the the uh, abductiveness all right or the abductive uh, concept when you're thinking of grounded theory right the grounded theory concept unlike traditional methodologies grounded theory does not begin with an existing theoretical meta theoretical framework or design so you are not building and there's a reason for that you want it to be as virgin as possible you're not bringing in uh, a particular theory you're not trying to explain that through your own theoretical framework so in that way while it is it uses hypotheses and uses you're dealing a lot in theories but it's also pretty theoretical so your endeavor is pretty theoretical you're not bringing in your own ideas into it you want something new to emerge everything emerges from the data which i just said to you the researcher does not start with a literature review or bibliography i just mentioned that this typically comes last after the data has been collected and when one wants to make comparisons between emergent and extant theories so there's extant theories at the end of the if you when you determine what you found what you discovered um, you have to obviously make make some comparisons between what is emerging through your data but also what's already written what have other theorists said about that is there an existing theory that describes what you're saying is coming through the data that you know you've got to understand most of the most of the theories are already out there and uh, and while i don't want to sound as though nothing else new is going to come because every day something new emerges but um, uh, most of us are not that lucky that we are going to come out with some grand theory and uh, which is going to be attributed to us to, until posterity right but there are people out there that have come out with some really brilliant theories now remember you're going to be up for a lot of criticism critique uh, and pushback from grounded theories theorists as well as um, uh, researchers and writers uh, who do grounded theory uh, you might think that you've discovered something spectacular and they may come back to you and say what the heck are you talking about this was written back in 1969 so you have to do your homework really well folks and grounded theory method can take you years and years and years to do okay so be careful before you embark on grounded theory uh, i just wanted to share this with you as an inductive approach i think it's great it's a very promising way of um, researching uh, uh, data and coming up with either new uh, ideas or um, ideas that will refine and transform some existing ideas uh, on, uh, on on phenomena all right so categories coding constant comparative categories are grouping together of instances events processes and occurrences that share central features categories may be at a lower or higher level of abstraction you'll have to read about all this it will make a lot more sense if you were part of my workshop live face to face we would be doing some exercises on this unfortunately uh, we are both at a disadvantage um, in this virtual setting low abstraction uh, and high abstraction you'll hear about all this in the in the literature that i will be sharing with you okay um, but this is all part of the analysis and formulating uh, what's coming out of the data 
coding. Coding is a process which you hear. Now, coding is also you do coding in phenomenological analysis and data collection is a process by which categories are identified and divided into low and high categories. In analysis of data, descriptive labels are initially attached to low categories, such as emotions. As analysis progresses, coding identifies data that shares characteristics of higher abstraction. So you'll hear, you'll hear the higher abstraction, lower abstraction, and how you're interpreting something, whether it's a concept or it's a feeling and emotion. Okay, so they're making a discernment there. They're making a differentiation there with that. Constant comparative analysis, a coding process that maintains momentum going back and forth. It's a process of reiteration going back and forth between convergences and divergences. And that's what makes the whole process so tedious in ground theory method. It ensures that the research is not only accumulating categories, but also categorizing them so really, uh, as I explained in phenomenology, you're actually distilling this. You're making this into more and more concrete, but you're making them into subunits which are easier to identify. It's like bite-sized segments, chunks of data that are created into smaller units. The goal is not to get into a homogenous mindset and allow all complexity to make its way uh, into emergent theory. So it's not to make things more and more complex. The goal is not to get into a homogenous mindset that this is the way it's going to be and everything is going to be the same and allow all complexity to make its way into emergent theory. So you understand, so you're not allowing all this extra complexity to come in and, and because and you feel you have this notion that if my study is more and more complex, it's going to be um, uh, you know, you're going to get more brownie points and it's going to be liked more in the academy. Remember, you are trying to distill as much as you're trying to collect data uh, through, uh, through the process, you're also trying to distill, break it into subunits of interpretation. Negative case analysis and theoretical sensitivity, researcher immerses in the data and looks at negative cases. Negative cases are categories that do not fit. These are outliers. These instances are identified and explicated in analysis in order to give the depth and complexity to the emergent theory. So you would know that these are sort of divergent. Okay. They don't fit in. They don't fit into, they don't, cannot be categorized in that same group. However, they're important and they're germane to your uh, analysis. So you term them negative cases, not as in negative as the opposite of positive, but negative as an outline. Researcher interacts with the data in order to identify low and high category. Um, saturation involves collecting further data in analysis so that the emergent theories can be challenged. Okay, this is a stage of refinement and transparency with the goal of reaching data theory and saturation. Okay, I was talking about that. It occurs when no new categories can be identified. No new, when categories are themes really. As we talk about the emergent themes in phenomenology, we talk about categories here. It is only a goal, but not reality for any modifications, changes will inevitably call for additional data, which may yield new material. So it's a very tentative, uh, fragile process of research. I want you to understand that. The tentative nature of grounded theory research, we're ending the presentation now, uh, and I wanted to share this with you, and I want to read this to you, just so can, if you could just follow along with me. This was by Glazier and Strauss, the, uh, the ones that formulated and developed the grounded theory method. When generation of theory is the aim, which it is, right, in grounded theory, because you're generating new theories or defining existing theories. If that is your aim, however, you are constantly alert to emergent perspectives. New stuff is emerging all the time, even as you're doing your study. New, there are others writing about your phenomena, maybe elsewhere in the world, maybe 7,000, 10,000 miles away from where you are, and you don't even know this. So you have to be alert to emergent perspectives. What are other theorists saying? Other contemporary authors writing about? What will change and help develop the theory? These perspectives can easily occur on the final day of the study 
or when the manuscript is reviewed in page proof. Oh my God. So now you've spent five or six years doing this grounded theory and you are at the final stage of your journey. You've run out of gas and you want this freaking thing to end. You want to earn the letters after your name with this grounded theory method. So the published word is not the final one. Unlike in phenomenology, unlike in other qualitative researches or even quantitative methods, what you presented, what you sent it up, we know that we after it is proofread, you send it up to your whoever's in charge at the university, they send it to ProQuest and UMI, and it's the final thing, it's a done deal, it's baked. Not so in ground theory. So the published word is not the final one, but only a pause in the never ending process of generating theory. So you may actually find on the final day, not always does it happen, but it can potentially happen that somebody could question that. And boom, your, uh, your faculty, your advisors might say, sorry, you have to go back and collect more data or take a look at this or take a look at that. Or it could be somebody from your, uh, one of the faculty members from your committee that might say to you, hmm, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. I think you're just, going too fast. Uh, you're, you're making this stuff up because I feel that there's something available already out there, something written about this. So what is the newness here? What have you developed? So be careful and cognizant of that, okay? Uh, it's a very tentative nature, all right? So be very, you're, you're walking on eggshells constantly, hoping that and, and again, you can sort of like mitigate this anxiety in a bit if you're doing your work thoroughly and if you're going into the extant literature and if you're reading up stuff and you're burning the midnight oil and making sure that you've got your I's dotted and the T's crossed, you may not run into these issues. You're likely not. But if you've done shoddy work and your know, faculty are passing that off, well, guess what? You're all going to be in trouble, and mostly you, because you're next on the block. All right? So just be very mindful of that uh, when you uh, entertain doing grounded theory. Have solid researchers on your team. Have um, advisors that are well-versed and steeped in grounded theory before you embark on that. All right, so here's where I'm going to to pause and, and, and end this uh, presentation because uh, if you see, is here it says day two of debrief and setting the stage. We would have gone on day two into breakout groups doing uh, exercises together in small group settings and having the group leaders then report out to the entire um, class on what they did. So we do the deconstruction and analysis of my doctoral study on phenomenology. I've used IPA. I also have a book out there on Amazon by the same name, uh, Negative Capability, a Phenomenological Study of Lived Experience at the Edge of Certitude and Incertitude that you can look up. Uh, we would have done the discussion of interpretive phenomenological analysis, laying the foundation for a new study. So all of this study, we would have done in breakout sessions, which of course we are unable to do here. Um, interpretive phenomenology and analysis, I would have done that, but it already has been done. So this is going to be a rehash on that, which I don't want to do in the interest of time. So please know that um, this is all available in my YouTube channel, very, very um, elaborately done. So take care, go into the channel, look up my, uh, IPA presentations there, okay? And um, so with that, I would like to end this. And uh, my uh, email address will be listed uh, well, uh, right below this presentation on YouTube when I send, or you can use, um, look up my other presentations and my email address is there. It is A-B-E-H-A-L, A-B-E-H-A-L, a b e h a l at email dot fielding f i e l d i n g dot edu. Please send me again. That's abahal at 
email.fielding.edu. Send me um, an email um, and I will be happy to send you uh, the uh, comprehensive folder of readings, ebooks, resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we can um, certainly uh, also uh, try to meet. Um, you know, if I have a workshop in your area, uh, we can certainly meet face to face at that time. But uh, with that, I want to just thank you all for taking the time to listen to my presentation um, and view these slides. Uh, uh, and if you want these slides, I'll be happy to send them to you again. Uh, but um, it's been a long presentation and I thank you for your patience and understanding and the limitations that we are currently experiencing. This was uh, certainly not uh, the way I would have liked to do it. I would have liked to have participants, but everybody's uh, schedules are a bit thrown off right now with this pandemic and hopefully this pandemic will pass and we'll get a vaccine um, in the not too uh, distant future so that we can mitigate this and get this beast under control. So again, thanks a lot. Have a great day and be safe everyone and take care of your loved ones. Take care, bye.